Have you ever chopped down a tree in Minecraft and been disappointed by the way that it just floats there? Well, in my game, that's not a problem because when you chop down a tree, it does this. This is Douglas and I'm building a voxel game engine of massive scale, an infinite world in which users can build and interact. I am pleased to report that in this video, I have completed the rigid body physics engine. I should mention that physics works for any object, not just trees. So if I create a structure and disconnect it from the ground, the object becomes its own independent entity. So how does it all work? And how did I get here? I want to frame this video around a key problem-solving strategy that I used throughout physics development, which is breaking a big problem down into a bunch of smaller, manageable pieces. When you think about something like voxel physics, the problem might almost seem unfathomable at first, but we can break the physics process down into two major components. A voxel object begins its life as just part of the terrain. The voxel object gets destroyed by a player, its base is removed, and then the voxel object falls down, eventually colliding on the ground or with other objects. So there are two key parts here. One is identifying when an object has become disconnected, and two is applying collision detection and response once that object has been identified. The first portion is a problem formally known as connected component labeling. At a high level, the goal of connected component labeling is to take a 2D or 3D image and figure out what portions of the image are connected. Now, this is conceptually a pretty simple problem to understand, right? Like if I asked you to point out all of the discrete pieces in this image, you would say, okay, well, there's one on the left there and one on the right there. And so I needed a way to apply this to my voxel scene so that when the base of a tree is removed, I can say, okay, now the tree has become its own connected component. I can turn it into its own object. To solve this problem, I opted for depth first search graph traversal. DFS is a classic approach. It's something that you would hear about in any computer science course. And it operates on a graph, which is a collection of nodes or vertices connected by edges. They can represent anything. For example, a graph could represent cities, some of which are connected by roads. And the question that DFS helps answer is where you can get to if you just start at one node and only walk along edges. You start at a source vertex and you choose an adjacent vertex that's connected by some edge, which you haven't seen before. And you walk along to that city. So for example, here we go Boston to Chicago. Then you choose another city that you haven't seen before connected to this new node and you continue the process walking on and on until you eventually reach a point where there are no more new cities to visit. When you get there, you start backtracking, heading back towards the origin. Once you get to a parent city, somewhere where you were previously, that still has a city that you haven't processed yet, a vertex you haven't seen, you walk to that vertex and the process repeats and repeats. You keep walking around until you've seen everything in this portion of the graph. And this gives you the connected component, right? Because if you walk around, you'll eventually hit all of the cities that you can. But by the definition of a connected component, there's no way that London or Paris would be included here because there's no edge that could have ever allowed you to get there during your depth first search graph traversal. And we can tie this nicely into voxels. Every voxel can be thought of as a node in a big graph. And the faces between voxels are almost the edges, right? If you start at one voxel, you can get to its six immediate neighbors. And I should mention that this is the way my physics system works. Two voxels are connected if they look like this or this. But diagonal connections such as this are not counted. 
and that just makes things simpler to deal with, and I also think it makes more sense. As an aside, there are many other interesting algorithms for connected component labeling that you can find on Wikipedia. Oftentimes, these algorithms are actually faster when they operate on images, rows of pixels. And the reason that these algorithms are faster is they scan, for example, entire lines of pixels at once, and they avoid having to push every new edge they see, every new vertex they need to visit into sort of a work list queue, the way you would need to with depth first search. They also have better cache coherency because they do process many pixels that are close together at once. But one problem with all of these algorithms that you'll see on Wikipedia is that they run in linear time to the number of pixels in your image. But is there a way to do better? Well, the people who have been watching my channel for a while can probably say it with me now. We can exploit the hierarchical structure of sparse voxel octrees. You see, my engine doesn't store every voxel individually. Instead, I compress my voxels into a data structure called a sparse voxel octree, or SVO. And the idea is that if you have a similar cubic region of voxels, where every voxel in the region has the exact same material or value, you just store that voxel value once for the entire octant. So this drastically reduces the memory footprint. The key application of voxel octrees to connected component labeling is the fact that if you've got one homogeneous octant full of solid voxels, you already know that that portion is fully connected. So what we can do is we can treat the octants, the homogeneous octants of our SVO as nodes in the graph rather than individual voxels. And this is a huge improvement because when it comes time to process, say, a chunk of 8x8x8 eight by eight by eight voxels, the computer processes that as one single node, whereas otherwise it would take, it would have to look at 512 different voxels and consider all of the adjacent edges and connections between them. It would be terribly slow. In the process, the algorithm writes all of the octants that were seen into a big, dense bitmap that allows me to query whether an octant is included in the connected component or not in constant time. I use this uh, information to remove the voxels that are in the connected component from the source volume later on. Having thought about this algorithm, I worked on the implementation and was able to get it optimized enough to run in real time. I programmed it to remove any voxel components that got disconnected from the main terrain, and I got to the point you see on screen, where wherever I chop down a tree, the top part of the tree that no longer touches the terrain disappears. And that brought me to the second major task that would be required for physics in my engine, which was collision response and rotation. When we left off last video, I had implemented a linear collision detection routine, which could tell me when objects would be overlapping after traveling a certain distance. It even worked for rotated objects, objects that were not axes aligned, but I did not have a way to make objects move and rotate in response to external forces in the scene. To begin, I quickly implemented the equations for taking a rotational velocity and an object's angle and adjusting that as time went on. And I got objects rotating in the engine using quaternions to represent their rotation. Quaternions are an extension of complex numbers and they're very useful because they store 3D rotations in a compact format and also allow for interpolating between two different rotations. But what was left to do was rotational response. That is, once an object had, for example, hit the ground, making it rotate so that it rested fully on the ground. And this was a big challenge. It's challenging because rotation in real life is very complex. Imagine placing your phone on the edge or the corner of a table. Whether the phone falls off or not is going to be dependent upon where the phone's center of gravity is 
and what portions of the table are face down touching the phone at any given time. And it could just be a line of points, it could be a plane. Unless you're very clever, you kind of need an infinite amount of information, right? You need to know the infinite points that are touching both the phone and the table at the same time. So what I came up with was an approximation. The way it works is during collision detection, I gather a discrete list of contact points. And I just roughly estimate these contact points because unfortunately, the separating axes test does not give you contact points directly. And then I sum up the torques that would be exerted by each of these contact points on the object to get a total torque, which I then multiply by the time step and add to the object's rotational velocity to get a new rotational velocity for the object for this frame. Then I just take the object's velocity and I apply it to the object's rotational position. So that was what I programmed. And it didn't work. I spent three weeks debugging issues. There were problems with incorrect object offsets and flipped coordinates. And so I spent three weeks debugging. And while I was able to iron out a number of these issues, there was always one persistent problem. No matter what I tried, objects seemed to pirouette. They would spontaneously just sit up and start spinning in the air, gaining infinite rotational velocity as though they were possessed. It was funny in a way. At least it would have been funny if it wasn't so incredibly frustrating. So I finally took a step back and decided to try to approach things in a more organized way. The technique that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, breaking a big problem in, down into small parts, can also be applied to debugging your code. I first tried to simplify the problem as much as possible by disabling rotation on all axes except one. So I was basically working in 2D. And then I went down and took the entire physics process apart, placing print lines between each stage so I could analyze their outputs and inputs independently. Then I went through and examined the output step by step. I looked at the octants of opposing box lock trees that were being checked for collisions. I looked at the contact points that were being generated from these octants. I tried to determine what the correct contact points would be. And everything looked right, except for the very last step. Because you see, during the process, I noticed something strange. Two objects had the exact same rotational velocity, at least according to my printouts, but they were spinning in opposite directions. There was only one possibility. The code for converting a rotational velocity to an adjustment of rotational position was wrong. Remember earlier how I mentioned that I use quaternions in my engine? Well, quaternion multiplication does not commute. I knew this, and yet when I typed the equations into my computer, I flipped two quaternions after seeing that final print line and scrolling down to the code that was responsible for updating object rotations, I clearly saw it. I just had to change this one line and swap around these two expressions on both sides of the multiply sign. And with that corrected, the trees began to crash down. The voxel physics engine is probably one of the toughest programming challenges that I've ever faced. That should be obvious from the timeline between this video and the last one. It's been over three months, but until now, I didn't have anything that I was happy with to share. There's definitely still room for improvement within my physics engine. It's not really physically accurate. Because it processes each object individually, it can't support more complex physics interactions like having a teetering stack of boxes fall over. If I were to redo the physics engine in the future, I would want to learn more about the constraint-based physics techniques, which are what engines like Teardown use. 
But for now, I'm very happy with what I've achieved, and I have no regrets with making a physics engine from scratch, because I learned an enormous amount. And I could not have done it without the organized and methodical approach of looking at things in little pieces. Physics is not all that I've accomplished over the past three months. At certain points, I got bored of working on the collision engine, and so I took some time to rewrite my multiplayer backend service from Go to Rust, and I bundled multiplayer together with the physics engine in a brand new demo, which is now available online on my GitHub and can be accessed in the description below. Before, my voxel engine was more or less a glorified 3D model editor. You could walk around, look at things, and add and remove voxels in various places. But now, with objects sliding around, hitting each other, reacting to gravity, it really feels like a dynamic world. And in the future, I want to add things like a character controller, sound, and other portions of gameplay that will create a more immersive experience. If you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate it if you could leave a like and also subscribe to my channel. It would really help me out. If you have any thoughts or questions, please leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching, and have a lovely day.